Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a remarkable man because he is both a soldier and a scholar as well as, I can promise you, much else besides. And uh, here he is in person, Matthias Rogg. Thank you very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. Hello, thank you very much uh, for your invitation. It's wonderful, wonderful to have you here. Now, uh, Colonel Matthias Rogg, to give him his military rank, is not just a soldier on active duty. In his capacity as a historian, he is also currently the di director of the Military History Museum in Dresden. His uh, specialist field, I ought to add, uh, is, uh, has been the role of the military in German society, which is, of course, a fascinating subject for discussion. So. A lot to talk about, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, it's great to have a military man here on the uh, programme. And I'd like to begin with the question, what is it like to be a military man in Germany? Um, I think you can compare with a military man in, in, in Britain or in France, uh, because uh, a lot of people in German are uh, what we would call in German, they sie fremden. Okay. They are a little bit timid. Uh, I think it has, uh, yeah, to do with uh, with our history, mm. with the history of the, especially the Second World War, yeah. the Holocaust, and everything what deals with the question of power and violence in that time, and therefore it was it was a very long way, and it was not so easy to find a position for a new army after the Second World War. Yeah. We have a broken tradition in our history and also in our military, especially in our military history, yeah. and therefore it was a long run. Um, to uh, um, to develop uh, German forces uh, in the last 55, 60 years. OK, we'll be talking about all those abstract questions that you've indicated there, but just tell me about how do people respond to you when, you, when you're out on the street, in your uniform as you are today? What is the response? Because you, you said this, you use this word, sie fremdel, they keep yeah. a sort of a little bit of a distance from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they ask me, Perhaps when I stay uh, at, uh, at, a, at the airport or uh, at a railway station, uh, they ask me uh, for the train uh, or uh, if I, or they ask me for some information. Mm -hmm. Because you see, I wear, I, I wear a uniform and I must be an official, perhaps a soldier or a firefighter, or, or, but, but, but not especially uh, an officer of the Bundeswehr. Yeah. And that means... Uh, the uniform of uh, a German officer is not so familiar for a lot of people in Germany. Exactly. You do. I mean, when I see you here today in your uniform, the first thought that comes to mind is that I haven't seen a military uniform for, I don't know, weeks or months. That's quite unusual in other countries. You see people in uniform much more regularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore, I wear the uniform wherever I can <laughs> because, yeah, it's my working dress. Yeah. And the people, they... Yeah, they see who I am mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes people ask me about the Bundeswehr, about military history, mm -hmm. about uh, politics or anything else because they recognize me. Interesting. You talked about Germany's broken tradition. From outside Germany, there's a lot of people, a lot of commentators who look at Germany and they say it's a little bit of a pacifist country. Is that... Are they right to say that? Yeah, I think they are right. Um, because um, after the Second World War, a lot of people, they had the idea, no war in future, no army. And uh, we had the slogan in Germany, without us. That means ohne uns, mm. not with us. Yeah. And uh, we have a very, very spe specific history. And... In no other country, we have uh, the, 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 the history or the, 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 the tremendous uh, experience with the Holocaust. And it has a lot of to do, the Holocaust, with the military, also with the military sure. and with people who wear uniforms. Yeah. And a lot of people, they can't, uh, um, um, yeah, or they, they don't see exactly, or they can't divide the between uh, SS or uh, the Wehrmacht or, uh, or other who, weird uniform. And therefore, I think uh, it, it, is, it is very, very complicated, not, not easy. And as I said, there was a long time was necessary to see that it is also possible for a new democracy, uh, democracy yeah. to uh, build up an army 
and a completely new structure uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, w with, with laws, with the constitution inside and an army which is uh, involved in the structures of democracy. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, again, topics that we'll come back to a little bit later. Let's just talk about you personally for, for, for just a moment. You are both a scholar, as I've mentioned, yeah. and a soldier. Yeah. Which came first? Um, I think first was a, was a soldier. Um, I um, became uh, an officer cadet in 1983 yeah. and I started an ordinary career as a tank officer. And uh, after eight years of service, I started uh, my, my studying at university. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it was not a common study uh, because uh, at that time it was not able to study history and modern history at the University of the Bundeswehr. So I went to a to an ordinary, mm -hmm. a regular say, university, a regular mm -hmm. university in Freiburg, uh, and and after I finished my uh, my my university career with my PhD, then I wanted to link both the military career and the academic career. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that brought me to the Military History Museum. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, if that's what you had set out to do, that is something that you have done very successfully indeed, I think it's fair to say, because since uh, 2010, Colonel Rog has been the director of, to give it its full name, the Bundeswehr Military History Museum in the eastern German city of Dresden. And a year or so after he took over the museum, it reopened after it had been reconstructed in grand style by the often inspirational, sometimes controversial, Commercial architect Daniel Liebskind. Uh, let's go on a tour of the building now with Matthias Rock. Like an arrowhead, the new structure cuts through the neoclassical facade of the Military History Museum in Dresden. The 30 meter wedge with a viewing platform interrupts the former arsenal's symmetry, symbolizing a break with old traditions. The building has been a Saxon armory and a museum, a Nazi museum and an East German one. Now it offers a new look at the history of the armed forces. American architect Daniel Liebeskind has given physical expression to the philosophy behind the museum, which its director, Matthias Rog, promotes to the public. When the museum was opened in 2011, the army colonel led his guests through the exhibition in person, and in uniform, of course, because the Bundeswehr runs the facility. It's a modern museum that doesn't see itself as a collection of heroic battle paintings and weapons, but as a self-critical look at the instruments of war. Bombs and missiles are shown as they are, threatening. And a display of prosthetic arms and legs for people wounded in war shows what they can do. The intention is to shock and be thought-provoking. This Wolf a Bundeswehr jeep hit a booby trap in Afghanistan. Three German soldiers in it were wounded. It's an exhibit that's personally important to Matthias Rog, because instead of military history, it shows the here and now. Even pacifists have their place here. This outfit from a demonstration is on exhibition, a parody of a uniform and medals worn by Petra Kelly, the 1980s peace activist and co-founder of Germany's Green Party. Matthias Rog says that too belongs in a military museum, even though he's been shaped by army life since his childhood. Matthias Rog was born in Wittmund in East Frisia in 1963. His father was a professional soldier. He often took his son with him into the field. The boy thought eating with the troops was the greatest. Matthias Rog is still an enthusiastic amateur cook. And he hasn't given up playing the guitar. He's been in the Bundeswehr since 1983. The Colonel is a sensitive art lover who paints in watercolors and is deeply rooted in his Christian faith. He often enthusiastically discusses how that fits with the life of a soldier. Being appointed director of the Bundeswehr Military History Museum was like a gift to Rog, who's also a history professor. He's interested in the relationship between the military and society, and he can look into that now with every new exhibition. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Colonel Matthias Rock.
And Colonel Rugg, the, the, the museum in Dresden, your museum, is a remarkable building and it's got this, you know, it's got this thing cutting into the middle of it, a yeah. wedge or an... The wedge, yeah. Is, you call it a wedge, We call yeah? it the wedge, yeah. Because it's a little bit like an arrowhead or an axe head or something like that. What, yeah. does, it, what does it signify? It's, yeah, it stands for violence and for power and the topic we are dealing with in the museum. Mm -hmm. And it cuts through the old arsenal like a cut in our history. Yeah. And you see, the German history in the 20th century is full of cuts. We have two revolutions, one in 1980, uh, 1918 and 1919, and the second revolution uh, we are just remembering uh, 25 years uh, after. We have two world wars mm -hmm. with uh, a very prominent uh, uh, yeah, role of, of, of German army and German politics. And we have two dictatorships, one in the GDR and the other uh, in, the, in the NS regime. Yeah. And that means a lot of cutting throughs through our history, through our tradition. And you can say it is a symbolizing architecture like an icon, an architecture, yeah, an, an icon architecture of the wedge. And without the wedge, it wouldn't work. The whole system, the whole idea of the museum wouldn't work. Mm. How important is it that the museum is located in Dresden? Because certainly the city of Dresden, for people outside Germany, has a huge resonance, and that resonance is linked primarily to the events at the end of the Second World War. It is very, very prominent. Uh, on the one side, we have the big collection mm. of uh, the Military History Museum since uh, 125 years. Okay, it is, um, yeah, like the basis for the museum. Uh, a collection of 1.1 million objects, but uh, the history of the city, of the destroying of the city in the Second World War, mm -hmm. in uh, uh, the evening of the 13th to the 15th of February 1945, it is, uh, it is very, very important because the peak of the wedge, it shows exactly to the point where the destruction of the city, uh, the destroying of the city in that night started and uh, the shape of the wedge is exactly in the way where uh, the uh, um, uh, where the aeroplanes started their attacks, and, and it is more more or less ex exactly like the shape of the destruction of the ancient city of Dresden. And therefore, you have a, a lot of bridges, a lot of links from the building and the architecture to the history of the of the city. Mm -hmm. And up to now, every year uh, on the 13th of February, people remember the destroying of the city and uh, I don't know any other city in Germany or any other region where uh, the war violence and the destruction at the end of the world is so much remembered than Dresden and by this it was uh, it was a logical consequence that Daniel Liebeskind uh, was looking for a strong link to the history of the city. It's fascinating stuff. It's quite abstract. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I know that for you it's very important that your museum really investigates the human component of war. Yeah. How war is experienced by individual human beings. Right. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, actually, in a military history museum, armory, weapons, uniforms, signals, flags, they stand in the centre. But we see uh, it's not enough. What we should be interested is human, yeah, you and me. Yeah. That means ordinary persons, man. Yeah. And we focus on man. The man stands in the middle of the history or of the story of our museum. That, my, that means man as perpetrators, especially soldiers, man or people as victims. And sometimes you don't have not only perpetrators or victims, but also the bystanders, mm. those who stand beside and look at the scenery and what are they doing? And, and that triangle of these three people, of these three uh, point of views, we want to tell the story and it is much more than a story of only of, 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 of military, but of violence, of the history of power and violence. And then we spread <coughs> with the seam and we see it is, um, yeah, in some way a universal soldier, uh, excuse me, a universal uh, museum. Yeah. What interests me is then, if we're talking about people, is how individual people respond. Because certainly when I began first coming to Germany, you would talk about the military experience as part of the human experience. And people would say, 
I don't need to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. War is bad. That's the end of the story. And there were very few books about war, very few films about mm -hmm. war, very few poems about war, which in other countries would be much more prominent. In the there'd, there'd be a public debate going on. That's only really begun to start in Germany in recent years. That's my feeling, at least. Yeah, and I think after the reunification, um, it started. And now we must say... 25 years ago or 30 years ago, military history was, uh, yeah, it is uh, a colleague of mine, he called it a schmuddelkind. Uh, that means a little, a, a little child uh, who's uh, playing in the mud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, no one was really interested. And some said, uh, why should we teach military history at university? But in the last 25 years, uh, we had in some way a revolution in the point of view of military history because we think it is we are so much involved in the questions of power and violence and we have so much suffered by the two world wars especially by the by the last world war uh, not only by the separation of the two countries and the cutting through by the by the uh, iron curtain uh, but all the by the um um uh the spätfolgen, uh, the consequences, the consequences, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the consequences of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, that now we see, we have to look at the war. We have to look at military. We have to look at military history mm -hmm. to know or to to understand better um, why history came in that or uh, developed in that way. Let up to be, now. Okay, and when you do that, what do you do in your museum with the fact that many people outside Germany for so long, rightly or wrongly, viewed Germany and viewed Germans as uniquely warlike, as uniquely aggressive? Yeah. What do you do with that perception that people have had of Germany in your museum? You can only answer if you change the perspective. If you have a different perspective on the same thing, mm -hmm then you have uh, the point where you can, can, can take every people to say, okay, you have your own experience, you think we are uh, more or less a peaceful uh, society or a society of former warriors, and we put them from that point of view and we look on the same things, the same story, and then you have to think about it because you see the other story. Mm -hmm. and you see that there's no truth in history, but a lot of reality, and that reality refers. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the points why we have so much success, because uh, it is sophisticated in one way, yeah, but it is, uh, in a special way, it's, it's honest. Okay, thank you. A war that changed the world, a war that was like no other that went before. What do you say about this war and what made it so so different from the from what had gone before as a military man? Yeah, it is the first world war, uh, the first war where the industrialization or the mass mobilization uh, was so important. And for me, in the center, for me, st stands in the center the delimitation uh, or the um, yeah. The, 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 it's an interesting the word there. The, the, the delimitation, delimitation, I see. So the lifting, the of, lifting of inhibitions. Of, yeah, right. Uh, by uh, the production of uh, ammunition, by mm -hmm. uh, the destruction by weapons, mm -hmm. the invention by new weapons as gas uh, uh, or uh, artillery, artillery mm -hmm. with, uh, with very, very big calibers, uh, with tanks, with aeroplanes and so on. Everything seems possible to be invented to kill people. And th this is one of the most important point of views for me, the fragmentation of the society, yeah. uh, the upside down, uh, nothing after the, year, after the war, after four, wars, uh, four uh, years of war was, uh, when, the war was uh, when the war started. Mm -hmm. The upside down, the fragmentation of the, of, of the society and also the casualties. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned 60 million of people we don't know exactly, yeah. but only only 9 to 10 million soldiers, yeah. the rest were civilians. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, especially in the winter time, in winter time of 1960 to 1970, in the famous so-called Steckrüben winter in Germany, uh, where uh, explain yeah, there was nothing to eat in Germany, uh, and uh, most of the people they they only had carrots yeah. or. They were eating roots. Roots, yeah. Quite literally, root crops, yeah. effectively. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't know exactly, but it seems that 700 to 750,000 civilians mm -hmm. died they, by starvation. Well, tell me this. I know at your museum you've got an exhibition, I think it's beginning on the 1st of, uh, of, of, first of August. The 1st yeah. of August, which yeah. is 1914, 2014, the 100 year anniversary, using the figure 14 and then uh, taking 14 biographies again to get the sort yeah. of give us a human approach to this immense yeah. catastrophe. Give me an example of one of the biographies and how it could be instructive for us. First of all, of, of all I want to say that we are a partner in a cooperation uh, with Arte and other TV stations. Mm -hmm. They produce uh, um, um, or they made a production uh, called 14 Diaries uh, of the First World War. Mm -hmm. And these 14 biographies who stand in the focus of the film production uh, you will find in our exhibition. And one is, for example, Ernst Jünger. Ernst Jünger was uh, a young the, man. The writer. The writer, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of people, they know him by his famous novel In Stahlgewitter, and he was a hero. Mm -hmm. And he wrote in a, in a heroic way. You will see his walking stick. It is, it is so ridiculous to take a walking stick when you, when you, uh, when you launch an attack. Yeah. But he took this walking stick with him to see I'm a gentleman. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's not only fighting, it's not only struggle, but it's only uh, a little bit of my, yeah, um, like, like walking like a gentleman through the war. And uh, there's something farcical about it. I think yeah. that's maybe the word. And yeah. On the one side, it is ridiculous. On the, on the other side, you see it is, uh, it is unbelievable. Yeah. It's, completely throwing out of, out of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think with these biographies, you can see on the one side, the war is very, very near to us because of the people, of their biographies, of their uh, characters, yeah. who in some times they are very, very modern. And on the other side, it is 100 years ago. That means three generations. Yeah, I was going to ask you because it is, it is, it is interesting. There are lots and lots of exhibitions all over Europe at this point in time, a lot of exhibitions in Germany, I think more than 80 exhibitions yeah. on the First World War. What, what do we learn though by comparing, you know, 1914 with 2014? What's the immediate contemporary relevance? The relevance is that the First World War and the Second World War belong together. There is a bridge between them. A lot of historians, they speak about the second 30s years war or the big um, um, uh, civilian war, of uh, um, European civilian war in the, in the 20th century. Yeah. And that means if you want to understand or to want to know much more about the second world war, you have to learn the first. Because uh, after the Treaty of Versailles, nothing was good. And we had we have such a, a, um, a fragmentation in Europe after the declining of the big empires, Russia and uh, the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the problems of the, dis of the decline of these empires, uh, we, we focus up to now. If you look at the Near, Near East or if you look at the Balkan or if you lo look at the Rims, of the former Soviet Union yeah. and the struggle between the neighbors, not only in the Ukraine and so on. All these struggles, all these problems began with and short after the First World War. And that means if you want to learn a little bit more about the 20th century, to, to understand why the 20th century is such an area in our history um, of, um, uh, um, uh, of, of, um, of violence, yeah. you have to know much more about the First World War. Okay, talking about violence, let's talk again, once again, the, 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 this whole notion of German militarism, because there's, there's the ongoing debate about who was to blame, who started the First World War, and we can't go there now, we just don't have time, we would need two hours to begin to discuss it, but German militarism takes a lot of the blame. What's the difference between the German military then and the German military now? 
<laughs> it is like uh, to compare uh, living on Earth and living on the Mars. <laughs> it's completely different. Um, the military, in and before the First World War, it stand at the, the peak of the column. That means uh, they were the best in the society and uh, everything in the society, it focused on the military, the military class. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and now the military stands in the middle of the society. It is involved. Uh, there is a critical society that looks on the military and um, it is not, yeah, you, you can say, we, we are not better than other people. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, you can say, it's completely different. One word that we haven't spoken about, and it suddenly occurs to me, I really would like to hear your view on this. We've talked about militarism, we've talked about combat, we've talked about it being an aspect of the human experience and its relevance. We haven't mentioned the word, or two words, heroes and heroism. Mm -hmm. How relevant are they or not to your personal military vocabulary? I think we, we also have in present, we have, we have, we have, we have heroes, yeah? Perhaps if you could look at sportsmen, and also in the military we have heroes, but in a completely other way. A hero for me is a self-standing person who does his duty and who does his, does his duty not for himself, mm -hmm. but for others, perhaps who serve for his country. And a hero in former times, perhaps in the First World War, or if you, if you look at the Second World War, he was a hero because uh, he did uh, a very good job as a military leader or that he is a brave man. Yeah. Brave is necessary, mm -hmm. but brave doesn't only mean um, to, uh, to use your weapon and uh, to, to launch an attack, yeah. but brave perhaps in a much more sophisticated way. The fundamental problem here, what we're talking about for the Bundeswehr at this point in time, is it's in a transition from being a conscription army yes. to being a fully professional force like in many other countries. Yeah, and it's not so easy mm -hmm. because a lot of the later professional soldiers, NGOs and uh, 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 officers, mm -hmm. they came to the Bundeswehr first by conscription. Oh, yeah. And then they saw, okay, uh, it is... The Bundeswehr is in, in a little bit, it, it, it is um, another army than I, than I thought. Yeah. And now they are interested and they start a career. And Talking of careers, I want to yeah. go in there because it, we, we've been to, we were looking at schools, we're talking about, uh, about recruiting. I have, we were just talking about our children while we were watching that report. We've got children of the same sort of age. My children have left school, but they haven't chosen a career yet. Tell me why they should join the Bundeswehr. The Bundeswehr is uh, very interesting for people um, who are not sure what should be the direction of my profession in the next years. Um, you will find yourself, you will, um, you will get a lot of inspiration by other, by, 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 your, by your superiors. Yeah. And we have a lot of possibilities for development and uh, I think um, you start, you do your job, and then you see other careers and other possibilities mm -hmm. to, um, to find a way for your own. And, and therefore, it is a very, very good experience for you for the first one or three or two years um, when, you, when you are not sure. Uh, you've got a lot of money, we heard in that report that we've just been watching, the, 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 for, for advertising for the for Bundeswehr. Advertising, yeah, yeah. yeah for, for the promotional campaign. Yeah, yeah. You don't pay very well. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you admit it. Yeah? <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah, yeah. it's a problem. And, uh, but uh, you must see, the society must see, the German society, that they need money for the army. Mm. Uh, there's no discussion in Great Britain. Mm. Uh, but you have, sometimes you have the same problems. Yeah. Not only by looking for the officers, for the higher ranks, mm. they are very, very well paid. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for, for, for the privates, for those for the, who we call... For the ordinary soldiers. The ordinary soldiers, what we call the, the engines, yeah? yeah exactly. Not the chieftains. Okay. Yeah. 
So there's that problem, and I'm glad, you, I'm glad you have admitted to it. There's another fundamental problem that the German armed forces have now, is that uh, I guess at the time when you signed up, that was back in... 1983. 1983, okay. Uh, at that time, there was no real chance of you being sent into a real yeah. sort of shooting and being shot at yeah, situation. Now, being in the Bundeswehr is dangerous. Yeah. And it shows you now what it means to be a soldier, that it could mean to shoot at another person, to kill some other, and also to be killed. And that is completely different to any other profession you will have, especially if, if you look at a policeman or a firefighter, it's completely different. And that's completely new for us, yeah, new experience. And also uh, the long distance, uh, when we stay in mission for months, perhaps for years, yeah. Uh, it's, it's tremendous for our families, yeah. Okay, we've talked about the dangers there, and that's important that we have done, I think. Let's talk about something a little bit more peace-like. Let's talk about <laughs> <laughs> one of your many pastimes. I know you like yeah. cooking, I know you like playing the guitar, uh, and you like painting, watercolours. Uh, yeah. Should we start with that one across there, yeah? Okay. Let, let, have we got that in picture? Yeah, go on. Tell me, okay. tell me what that's all about. Yeah, it is Helgoland, one of my favourite islands, and uh, I did this picture this watercolor from the ship when oh. we left when we left Helgoland I had, I had only I think 20 25 minutes and you have and to you could paint. keep a steady hand on board the boat that you yeah were yeah, on. yeah 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 <laughs> and you have to to paint very very fast yeah uh, and uh, the perspective is changing yeah and uh, it works or it doesn't work but yeah. I think it, it did work. <laughs> why, 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 did, why did you, how did you come to uh, painting and water painting in the first place? Who did you learn it from? Who inspired you? Um, I, I was interested in, 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 in arts and fine arts since I was uh, in school. Yeah. Uh, but I started in uh, painting by myself. I started in 1991. Yeah. Uh, my wife, she said, oh no, it's, it's, so, it's so boring. Always when you have a free time, you go to a museum, or you read a book, uh, try another thing. You have, uh, you, you have such a good uh, skill in, in making sketches and watercolors. Mm. And then I started and I've, I made the experience that is wonderful. You are in a completely other world. Here's another one. We've just got time for one more of your wonderful watercolors. And I particularly like this one because we've talked about the city of Dresden. This race is only a, a very, very fast sketch. I think I did it in 10 minutes, yeah. It's the water, But it's like a Dresden. snapshot. It's, yeah, yeah. 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 The well, river Elbe. And this shows us what survived of the city after the yeah. fire bombing that yeah, we've been what was about, rebuilt. Yeah, of the destruction, what survived and what was rebuilt. Yeah, yeah. most, of, most of, uh, of the buildings you see are uh, very built, yeah. The okay. opera. Lovely paintings. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing them along. Great stuff. We, uh, at the end of the show, we like to do a, a short quiz, yeah? Where I give okay. you alternatives, yeah? Uh, here we go. Uh, oh, I can hear the music. Are human beings naturally peaceful or naturally aggressive? They are naturally peaceful. We're going to leave it there on a very, very <laughs> peaceful note. We don't have any time for any other questions, but he has been a wonderful guest, a very compelling guest, Matthias Rog, Colonel Matthias Rog. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then come back next week. Bye-bye until then. Tschüss.